so the title of my talk today is Future Shocked, past tense. And where that comes from is that I'd been meaning for several years to reread Alvin Toffler's 1970 runaway bestseller, Future Shock, and see how his vision of the future panned out, and then maybe put together a talk about it. So here's that talk. Uh, right up front, I'm going to say I tried to cram too much into this at first, and I had to cut stuff out. So I hope that's w that what's left flows. If it doesn't, and I leave any gaping holes, ask me about it and talk back. Um, so why now? Uh, it seemed appropriate for several reasons. First, this year marks the 50th anniversary of its publication. Uh, I bought my paperback copy in 1972 for $1.95, says that somewhere on the spine, and read it while I was still in high school. And I hadn't reread it since until now, but it made a lasting impression on me as I was reminded while rereading it after all this time. And as it says right here on the back, Future shock will intrigue, provoke, frighten, encourage, and above all, change everyone who reads it. And as I reread it, I realized it really had. Some of it had really stuck with me for nearly 50 years. Um, but also, 2020 has been a year of rapid change, so it seemed to fit that theme. And somehow it seems especially appropriate on this last Sunday of 2020 as we prepare to enter a new year fraught with new possibilities. Future Shock is primarily, the book, is primarily a warning of the deleterious effects on us of constant change in nearly every aspect of our lives. However, a lot of the book is devoted to explaining why the rate of change is accelerating and to describing what specific changes Toffler envisioned. So how did he do with his predictions? Well, it became clear as I was rereading it that in 1970, we thought we knew what it was that we didn't know yet. Then, as undoubtedly now, we were wrong. A lot of Toffler's specific predictions either seem silly in hindsight, he really thought that paper, paper clothes were going to be a thing as opposed to about a 10 minute fad. Um, or they were way off on the time frames. He was right though about the pace of change, just not always about in which specific directions those changes went. Uh, it's possible his predictions got more accurate in his later books, but I haven't read those. But the book remains quite relevant because the threat of future shock is not so much about the effects of specific changes as it is about the acceleration of change and the effects of the pace of change on us. And as far as the pace of change, oh, we're there, folks. Uh, indeed, it's possible the computer and communications technology has advanced far beyond what Toffler could have envisioned. Uh, just a reminder that in 1970, the computer revolution was having a major impact on society at the institutional level, and it was possible to sort of maybe fuzzily peek into the future. But there were no personal computers, no internet, no World Wide Web, which, by the way, was invented in 1989 by Tim Berners-Lee, who subsequently became a Unitarian Universalist. Uh, no cell phones, no Google, no Facebook just some rather fuzzy notions that computers were going to change everything. Toffler saw us as entering the super industrial or post-industrial age, or as he referred to it in his 1980 book by that name, the third wave. The first wave was the agricultural age in which the human population was primarily involved in food production. Uh, you'll note that there was a whole long hunter-gatherer period before that that I saw somebody refer to as the zeroth wave. But uh, The second wave was the industrial age, beginning with the industrial revolution, in which the population was primarily involved in manufacturing and related industries. And you'll note that the um, agricultural age lasted about 10,000 years, the industrial age all of about 150, before moving on to uh, the super industrial age, also known as the information age, 
in which there are more white collar workers than blue collar workers. That's how somebody marked the beginning of it, is the one change, uh, because of increased automation. And the population is primarily involved in service occupations. The information age is marked by rapid technological change, which leads to a whole host of cascading changes in every facet of our lives. Um, our lives in the information age, according to Toffler, are characterized by transience compared to, that's transient CE, not transient TS. Transients are not dominating our lives. Uh, compared to past generations, we have to deal with a steadily increasing number of novel situations. And that includes a steadily increasing rate of turnover in all three tangible elements of the situations we encounter, people, places, and things. The turnover in places is real. Americans move a lot more frequently and change jobs more frequently than they used to. It's possible that some of that might be offset by the trend toward working from home, which makes it practical for some people to change jobs without relocating. Uh, Toffler saw an increasing trend toward the use of temporary staffing services, which happened for a while, but has largely morphed into outsourcing and the so-called gig economy. Uh, he described an increase in what he called modular relationships. As we encounter more and more people in the course of our day, the tendency is to interact with them only as far as necessary and as appropriate for the nature of the interaction. Uh, for instance, the people at the coffee shop who make your coffee or whatever. Uh, I suspect that that's actually more a result of urbanization than technology per se, and kind of a necessary approach for city dwellers to uh, run across a lot more people in the course of a day than some of us country folk. Uh, Toffler saw the service economy eventually being automated itself and the population primarily being involved in producing experiences. Presumably, as we became less attached to things and places, experiences are what we would rather accumulate. I do think this transition has started. Uh, those experiences could be a lot of things, uh, art displays, concerts, amusement parks, recreational experiences like skiing or rafting, movies, escape rooms. Uh, Toffler had some pretty wild ideas, 70s type ideas that probably won't come to pass but there will also probably be a lot more that nobody's even conceived of yet. Of course, those getting out and doing things experiences could be largely supplanted by experiences in one's own living room with streaming video on demand, ever more realistic games and simulations and better virtual reality setups. The other components of situations Toffler called intangible our organization and information. As for organization, he saw bureaucracy as, as adequate for the industrial age, but not responsive enough to a rapidly changing environment. He expected that the information age would demand what he called an ad hocracy with fluid, ever shifting organizational structures, uh, lateral decision making going across the organization instead of up and back down, uh, and so forth. Since 1970, and this is my observation, the corporate world has made a fair amount of progress in that direction. Uh, government entities and the educational system, for example, not so much. Uh, schools were, and mostly still are, modeled on industrial age organization and aimed at preparing students for an industrial age world. The information deluge is to us the most visible and relatable aspect of the acceleration of change. Uh, Toffler pointed out that we all carry around a mental model of the world, some parts of which are reasonably accurate, some parts not so much. For a society to hold together, its members must have mental models that bear some semblance to reality. As the rate of new information increases, it gets harder and harder to keep our models updated sufficiently to function appropriately. I think the rate of information increase is offset in part by our ability to rapidly access information we need via internet access. That doesn't slow the incoming rate at all, but it maybe gives us a little better chance of keeping up. 
The problem, of course, is, lies in distinguishing information from misinformation, of which there is plenty. Uh, technological change has enabled the pace of cultural change to accelerate. Pop culture in particular, music, fashion, slang, etc., moves along at a frenetic pace in the age of social media. I think that because of social media, new content spreads faster than it used to, so that there's nowhere near the lag between, say, urban and rural culture that there once was. There's still a genera generational lag there, I'm sure. But while the social media phenomenon looked like it would homogenize culture and did for a while, it's also leading to its fragmentation and also to faster and faster changes. Andy Warhol was right about everyone being famous for 15 minutes. Maybe in the internet age, it's more like 15 seconds, but uh, who would have thought that social media influencer would actually become a job description, let alone a career aspiration? Actually, the concept of marketing a lifestyle is an old one. Only the medium has changed. And Toffler wrote a lot about adopting a package, prepackaged lifestyle to reduce the number of decisions one has to make, sort of as a defensive mechanism against future shock. The relative uniformity of pop culture before the information age was largely driven by the barriers to entry imposed by the high cost of producing content. Now that process has been democratized. Anybody can self-publish a book or produce and disseminate video content on a near zero budget. Actually, we've been headed that way ever since word processors and home printers became readily available and affordable. Uh, neither way is all good or all bad. Homogenization promoted a common culture and a sense of unity. Fragmentation gives each of us more freedom of expression and lifestyle, but it divides us. We lose a more or less common reference frame. It was easier to find common ground when large numbers of us watched the same movies and TV shows, read the same books and magazines, listened to the same music, and had the same few news sources. The information age in general has its good and bad points. On the one hand, it connects the world. The internet, like all major communications technology breakthroughs, has made the world a smaller place. Roughly a quarter of the world's population have Facebook accounts. Being able to communicate and connect with people around the globe is a wonderful thing. On the other hand, it paradoxically enables fragmentation and division by allowing all sorts of fringe groups to organize and to promote hatred and destructive ideologies. Ready access to the internet puts vast quantities of useful or interesting information at our fingertips. It makes both formal and informal education on almost any topic available to anyone who wants it, often free or for low cost. But it also exposes us to vast quantities of misinformation that can lead us astray if we don't learn to distinguish what's real from what's bogus. Or frankly, if we don't really want to in some cases. Uh, staying connected can keep us up to date, but it also leads to our being totally inundated with ads, spam, even stuff we think we want, like news. So after a while, the news gets a little too much. Uh, we are definitely well into the era Toffler called the super industrial age, and technology feeds on itself. Every technological change that increases information flow enables the next change to happen faster. A lot of uh, computer programming is now machine learning via neural networks, for example. The process of computers programming themselves quietly happened when we weren't looking. The COVID-19 epidemic rapidly became a pandemic as a result of how much and how rapidly humans move around the globe these days. The virus doesn't spread itself, we spread it. Future pandemics may be more severe, maybe less, or almost inevitable, but silver lining, developing a vaccine in less than a year is truly breathtaking. Take a moment to appreciate just how breathtaking and how technologies that weren't even conceivable when Future Shock was written were brought to bear on this. 
how far are we really from vaccines, including say cancer vaccines, being developed almost as soon as a disease starts to spread? The upheaval brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic has had me thinking about the technological and cultural changes we've already seen this year, which uh, largely were things that were coming anyway, or trends that were coming, but were forced into use sooner than they otherwise would have been. These include a huge increase in the number of people working from home. Modern technology and high bandwidth internet make this more feasible than it was a few years ago. And now that it's been tried on a large scale, it will probably continue to grow. Where it can be done effectively, it has advantages for both the employer and the employee. And many of those forced into it by the pandemic will probably continue to work from home permanently, or at least for part of their work week. Uh, my brother in particular was telecommuting for quite a while and he has uh, something over an hour commute each way every day. And working from home, he felt like he just, it felt like a vacation. He just had all kinds of extra time in his day. And meanwhile, the employer doesn't have to keep up as much office space and so forth. So uh, many of those for, for when well, I said that, an added bonus is reduced traffic for those who do still have to commute. The normalization of video conferencing for both organizational and personal applications, sort of like this, and the rapid refinement of tools for accomplishing it. Again, this would not have been possible without high bandwidth internet. The first time I saw a video phone call was in 1965 at the New York World's Fair, but that was a demo from one side of the room to the other with a big old cable going in between. Uh, now that so many of us are able to use it, I expect it to stick around either as a standalone meeting capability or as an adjunct to allow virtual participation in live meetings. I uh, expect to see much higher utilization of grocery pickup and curbside service at say restaurants. Uh, a lot of us have come to appreciate the convenience. I expect that newly built stores and restaurants will be designed with that in mind and possibly with more outdoor dining options as well. Um, remote education, uh, not necessarily as a full replacement, but as a partial replacement or a supplement. Uh, both classroom teaching and self-paced learning are possible that way. Um, Toffler did see that coming, as did a lot of the science fiction authors I used to read. So. Uh, that one's been, uh, a lot of us have been wondering where that was for a long time, so now it's here. Uh, the dominance, uh, I expect to see, and this may be a sad one, these are, these are, I'm offering these up value neutral. I'm not saying whether I want them to happen or not. Uh, the dominance of chain stores and restaurants over individual establishments, unless those establishments can fill a specific niche. That's a trend that's been underway for a long time, and the chains are more likely to be able to withstand the economic impact of the pandemic, which is a nice way of saying a lot of mom and pop restaurants and small stores are gonna go under, and already have. Um, things like large concerts, sporting events, and cruises will likely make a full comeback, but maybe not till late summer or early fall. Uh, I've noticed that people have short memories uh, likewise, I assumed that the pandemic would, uh, would put an end to buffet restaurants, salad bars, and indoor malls, but now I'm not so sure. Again, people have short memories. <laughs> uh, movie theaters, on the other hand, may be on their way out. There was already a trend toward more first-run movies being released directly to streaming services, and that was obviously accelerated by the pandemic, and the number of people going to movies as opposed to watching them at home has been that ratio has been going that way for a long time. Um, some somewhat longer term trends that are gonna change our lives down the road. Uh, automation of both manufacturing and service jobs is going to continue. I once realized that that automation of service jobs sounds a little funny until you realize that the first uh, ATM was one of those. Uh, Right. For the first ATM started putting is reducing the number of bank tellers who had jobs. Uh, 
let's see, self-driving vehicles are going to be ready for prime time soon. Uh, I don't know what soon means exactly, but within a decade, certainly, uh, probably sooner. I'd bet that within 20 years, sadly, truck driver will be an obsolete occupation. Uh, personal assistants like Siri and Alexa will get better at their jobs. And as they do, and we grow to trust them, they might take over some low level decision making for us. Uh, maybe decide that we don't really want to see that ad, that email or that ad, or maybe it's time to order some more dog food. When they start using our credit cards, and you might get a little worried. But, um, and maybe they'll insulate us from some of the demands of constant change and some of the constant decision making required. Um, and it's kind of weird because if you grew up with science fiction, you always pictured that someday you'd have a personal assistant uh, that, uh, you know, was a humanoid robot who would stand there and take orders from you. And now it's a disembodied voice somewhere, but it doesn't matter if they do the job, I guess. Uh, change is coming so fast these days that it feels to me like we're approaching a breaking point, a singularity. And at a singularity, almost anything could happen. And it could be sooner than we expected. And just speculating on some possible outcomes, one is a uh, utopia, sort of a golden age in which automation-fueled automation productivity frees us from material want. Everybody is free to follow their bliss and develop their potential. And we develop the technology and the culture to let us live sustainably. Or uh, a society that splinters and collapses under the weight of too much change too quickly with drastically bad outcomes or a dystopian feudalism with the wealth all concentrated at the top and the rest of us left fighting over crumbs. Uh, again, anything can happen. Uh, just got to work, work for the best and hope for the best. But Toffler said, we may define future shock as the distress, both physical and psychological, that arises from an overload of the human organism's physical adaptive systems and its decision-making processes. Put more simply, future shock is the human response to overstimulation. Toffler described the orientation response and adaptive response that together constitute our response to stress. The stress response is an integral and necessary part of life. Stress in and of itself isn't bad. Too much stress or the wrong kind of stress is. Uh, there is a far more in-depth look at stress and how to manage it in the book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky. I highly recommend that one. Um, and not just for the title. Toffler presented a lot of proposals for a societal response to future shock, which frankly aren't very helpful to us as individuals. His proposals primarily described how he thought things should be, but didn't provide much of a plan for how to get there. Like many such recommendations, they would almost require a top-down implementation, and that's directly at odds with his information age adhocracy, more bottom-up view. I find it ironic that Toffler had the foresight to conceive of the super industrial age, but not the ability to get fully get behind, get beyond the industrial age mindset he was indoctrinated into, like a lot of us were. Uh, or a 70s patriarchal mindset in his language, for that matter. Every, all the workers in the book are men. It's <laughs> but that's just, that's the language of the time. It was, that's the 70s. But. It's a little jarring to read it now, that's the only thing. On education, we've done virtually none of what Toffler suggested, but he did correctly predict the rise in homeschooling. But he didn't predict that the primary push of that would be fear of secularism or, you know, trying to keep the kids religious. <laughs> Uh, some of his ideas have been experimented with here and there, but nothing like the wholesale reinvention of education he advocated. The widespread standardized testing we use just means that we're doing a better job of measuring against and educating to obsolete industrial age standards and was definitely not something he would have suggested. He thought we needed to put more effort into anticipating the future. This is perhaps not a very Buddhist thing to do, but imagining the future, projecting our virtual selves into it, 
is perhaps the very definition of consciousness. Forewarned is forearmed, as the saying goes. I'd agree that we do need to be teaching our students to envision the future. Uh, he talked about the need to guard against deploying new technology without considering its consequences, although not about how exactly to do that. He mostly referred to guarding against adverse physical and environmental consequences of deploying new industrial age technology, which we have done to some degree since 1970, which was after all the year of the first Earth Day, and only touches on the societal cultural consequences of, and only touches on the societal cultural consequences of explosive information age technology, which has become absolutely dominant and which we've deployed with almost no restraint. As for individual strategies for coping with accelerating change, he had some useful suggestions, as well as some examples of unhealthy approaches or maladaptations, as he called them. The maladapters include the denier, who is someone who adopts the attitude basically that things haven't really changed. It just looks like it. That's just superficial. But things are still always still be the same. Uh, the specialist is someone who manages to keep up in their one narrow field while completely ignoring change in other areas. Uh, the reversionist, one who yearns to return to an earlier, supposedly better time, which for those on the left side of the spectrum may mean going back to the pre-industrial days when life was simpler, conveniently ignoring the nasty, brutish, and short aspect. For those on the right, it may mean the heyday of the industrial age in the 50s or early 60s, when everybody knew their role and life wasn't so confusing and things were pretty good if you were a white man. <laughs> <You know. laughs> in both cases, they may perceive that earlier time as offering more freedom, but Toffler pointed out repeatedly that the information age will lead to more freedom, not less, and that the problem will be that we have too much freedom. There are too many choices to, to, to decide between, and that can be paralyzing in and of itself. Uh, and the uh, fourth maladapter is the super simplifier, one who thinks that there's one underlying universal idea that explains everything that's going on and ties it all together in a neat package and makes sense of it all. And perhaps conspiracy theorists would fit into this category. Probably some religious folks would fit into that category. And again, another probably unhealthy response is to join a group that makes your lifestyle choices for you. Now, here are some ideas for healthy coping. I may have mentioned some of this in my last talk, which was kind of about dealing with change also, but if so, well, it bears repeating. His first suggestion is to find a way, is finding ways to reduce unwanted sensory bombardment. This is harder now than it was in 1970, partly because there's so much more of it, and partly because we paradoxically seem to want unwanted, paradoxically indeed, seem to want unwanted bombardment and to be drawn to it. Uh, and if you don't believe me, look up doom scrolling sometime. Uh, if you can, treat your home as a sanctuary, a place where things change at you or your family's chosen pace. If you can't, find another sanctuary, a spot in the woods somewhere. Uh, develop a daily routine and set of habits to minimize your need for inconsequential decision making so that some of your decisions are made for you, by you, by an earlier you, but uh, so you don't have to decide on every little thing you do in your day. Uh, schedule some offline time, a couple hours a day or one day a week, and turn off all your outside connections, your cell phones, your computers, your television, uh, do that unless you're a first responder on call, please. Then please stay in touch. Um, try to slow down, not stop changes in your personal environment, uh, whether they're things or social relationships. Uh, hold on to things longer, uh, join less groups. Just, you know, try to control the rate of change in your personal environment. Um, 
about decision making on minor matters, we, or at least I, make shopping decisions, for example, complicated because we can now, and therefore we're expected to, or we think so. So where I used to, if I wanted some household appliance, I don't know, uh, a new toaster, I'd go down to Walmart or wherever and go in and they'd have three different toasters on the, uh, on the thing. And I'd go, that one looks, yeah, that's, that's about what I want. And it's the cheapest of the three. So I'll, I'll take it. And that would be the extent of my research. Now I go into Amazon and I have to look at every freaking toaster in the free world and look at all the reviews and read and make sure, oh, that one says the uh, element burnout after a year. I don't know. And, um, where and, and in the old way, the only the only additional research I would do is if I'd buy a toaster if it was a certain brand and it worked well for me, then I'd develop some brand loyalty. So the next time I'd go straight to that brand, or if it crapped out on me, the next time I'd go anywhere but that brand, then I'd do my own research. But now I have to treat buying a thirty dollar toaster like it's the uh, most important decision of my life. And it's like just pick one, you know, and go. With it. Um, so you know. Uh, so just try to try to keep things in perspective. Uh, a lot of these things that I'm telling you are things I'm telling myself that I need to start doing. But, um, uh, work on your critical thinking skills. That's a lot of, think of that as a personal spam filter and just filter out the incoming information. If it's, you know, if you can immediately recognize it as junk, just ignore it and let it go. Um, uh, meditation is always good for just uh, finding a little calm in your life and a time when you're not having any incoming information. It has other benefits too, but it shuts out the outside world for a little bit. And that's, uh, that's basically all I have. So I'm going to close as I always do by reminding you that it's, uh, that life is hard. So help each other through it. Try to leave it better than you found it. And I hope 2021 is a good year for you. Thank you.